something like this. Um, I, I showed a couple of these a few weeks ago, and, and Dane asked me to do a demo on this, so so that's what we're going to do. Um, it's a fairly plain piece of wood, which I think is a good place to start with this. Um, I mean, I'm all for if you've got a nice figured piece of wood, use it as it is, um, make the most of what the wood does. But here, it's a fairly plain piece of wood, so um, I see that as a blank canvas to do other things with. So um, here we've got red and blue. What this is, it's a base texture with acrylic gesso. Then when that's dry, acrylic airbrush paints sprayed over the top. And I've got this one here. Um, there's a bit of a stipple texture on that. Not quite sure how well the camera picks that up, but that's a stipple texture. Um, there's another one here. This one's actually just pine. Um, I think it's yellow pine, but just pine, fairly simple. Um, and on the sides, you can see there, it's it's more sort of a linear pattern. So I've just done that with a brush um, using the same acrylic gesso and then colors over the top. I've got purple, orange and yellow on that one. And then another one here. Again, this one's a, a stipple texture with green and blue. Um, and the highlight of the texture, I've actually sanded back slightly. So you're getting sort of white flecks where the heights of the texture is. So, so by the end of the evening, I will have shown you how to do all of those. So um, we'll move on. I'm just going to grab a piece of wood. I've got myself a couple of blanks prepared here. One, one's pine and one's sycamore. Um, what we, this is, this is the English version of sycamore, um, which is much plainer than your, your American version of sycamore. Um, we, we call the same thing two different things, but um, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. It's, it's, it's part of the Acer family. It's, um, it's a relative, but yeah, a different t tree. Um, and this one is just ordinary pine. Um, so so um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with the sycamore one but uh, it could be either of those. So we'll go with this. This one's got a slight corner missing there where the bark was, but as I'm going to shape the bowl that way anyway, and, and this will be the bottom edge of the curve, that'll get turned away at the, at the sort of turning stage on the lay. So that's not going to be a problem. I've prepared this by putting a hole in the centre for a screw truck. That's with a, with a smallish sort of flat top blank like this, that's normally what I would do. Um, it's a quick and easy way to mount that on the lathe. So we'll switch to the lathe over here. You can see there, that's my screw chuck. I just want to hit the record button, I forgot. No, that's it. I want to rec record it for myself. Um, so, so I've got the screw chuck here on the lathe. This one, let me just adjust that camera just a fraction. So there, um, this one screws directly onto the, onto the chuck, on, onto the spindle. Um, I have got other ones that you can just put in the chuck, like this one. That one is designed to be mounted in a chuck, um, and um, both, both do the same job basically. But uh, yeah, this one fits the spindle, so just less less stuff on the. Uh, on the spindle so so it actually puts your piece of wood closer to the closer to the bearings and it's always a good idea to keep your wood as close in as possible to minimize any sort of overhang um, so you've got you're spacers you've got spacers on your screw yeah there's a wooden yeah there's a wooden spacer there it's just just a probably three eighths inch ish piece of wood it can be any any type of wood is fine um on a smallish blank a short short screw is fine um, so, so, um, I mean, here I have actually got the thickness to, to put a hole in for the full length of that, but that's, that's enough to hold it, um, roughly half the length of that screw. This screw is, it's a, a, I drill it eight millimeters or what's that? Five sixteenths, isn't it? Um, so that's what I would drill for that particular one. It's an Axminster one. I think they do three different sizes uh, and that's the. The bigger of the three. Can I zoom out a little bit? There you go. How's that? Um, so initially, I'm just going to set up my tool rest across the face of the blank. 
let's go over that way so just setting up the rest over on the the face of the blank um center's about there so i'm putting the rest just a little below center and as i just put a fresh piece of wood on the lathe what i've done is set the speed of lathe to minimum um i'll try and remember to do that when i take the piece of wood off the lathe the last piece off so the next time i turn it on it's already set to slow um mainly because if i'm turning something small i'm going to be turning it at fairly high speed and if i go and stick on a, a large piece of wood it's going to be turning at a much lower speed so ideally start slow and gradually wind the speed up um, rather than put a big piece of wood on running at high speed which which could lead to problems um so yeah i mean my ideal way of working is to adjust that speed when i take the piece of wood off like i said so if i forget when i put the piece of wood on it's already there um but but this time i have remembered so it is set to slow i've got my visor on so i'm just going to drop that down so my voice might get a little bit boomier if, if my voice is a bit muffled with this just just let me know and i'll, I'll grab some goggles instead so we'll we'll go with this and see how it goes um turn the lead on that might help so i've got that running fairly slow and you, you can't see me but um actually you probably can if i switch over to this camera over here there so so where i'm standing is in line with the headstock rather than in front of that piece of wood so as i turn the speed up if something goes wrong and that comes off i've forgotten anything then i'm not standing in the firing line so that's what i normally try and do i, I get out of the way turn that up um and once it's at the, the speed it's going to run out and nothing's come off then 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 i'll feel more confident about standing in front of it so i'll switch back to the other camera now so i've got a a half inch spindle gauge here with a um fingernail grind on it so so that's my preferred tool on a small blank like this the reason i generally use a spindle gauge on the outside of a bowl is because my my spindle gauges are all ground with this fingernail grind but a lot of my bowl gauges aren't i've got i'll just show you one here quickly this one here you can see that's got a straight grind or traditional grind whatever you want to call it so it's not got the swept back wings so that's very good on the inside of a bowl but i can't do a pull cut on the outside with it because it hasn't got the wings um so I, I do have one or two bowl gauges with wings ground on them um generally larger ones so so i use those on larger bowls but for one this size i think this one should work all right so what i'm going to do is angle my gouge into the wood so so um the left wing is hitting that center line so if i've got my rest set correctly i can cut right on the center line and then pull backwards and actually you can cut backwards and forwards with this and all i'm trying to do is flatten off the face of the blank you can see there i haven't actually gone all the way to the edge but really i'm, I'm all for sort of making it as efficient as possible so so what i've done there is just flattened off the bit in the middle which is the bit that matters because that's where i'm going to make my chucks bigger so the bit on the outside doesn't matter i'm going to turn that away so i don't waste time flattening it so i've got some dividers here um so i'm going to put the the left point on the rest i i bore that across the center of the wood and scribe a line and then adjust the position of the dividers so the right point is over where the line appears then i know it's the right i've got it centered properly and it's the right side so there's my spigot marked so i just need to expose some wood to create my spigot um what I can also do at this stage is just rearrange things a little and bring in my tail stop for a bit of extra support. Um, I'll try and move that back as far as I can just to keep this uh, screw out the way so I can see that's in front of where the camera is. Um, so, I'll, so I'll extend this almost all the way. Um, all, all the actions over on this side rather than where the thing that where the um lever is but uh i'd rather it not be there all the same 
So I'll set my rest up again fairly close to the centre. And if, even if I don't leave the centre there for support, I'll bring it in and mark the centre so that later on, when I reverse this to turn that foot away, um, I've got a centre mark to, to relocate it. You'll, you'll see that, that later, how that actually works. Um, but I'll leave the centre in place, the, the, the live centre in place, so that's giving me a bit of extra support. It does mean that if I, if I want to, I can take big cuts and not worry too much about it. So initially, I'm just pushing my gauge towards the headstock here. Again, using that left wing, sort of a variation on that pull cut by just pulling that left wing in. And you can see that quite quickly is removing enough of that wood for me to create a spigot. Um, the reason I do that cut rather than coming in from the edge like this with a push cut is if I'm doing this cut with a push cut, I'm cutting into the end grain twice on every revolution because this is a conventional side grain bowl. Um, whereas if I'm pulling the cut this way, it's all side grain. So in theory, it's an easier cut on the tool than probably on me too. So I'm just going to square that spigot up now. And to do that, I'm just pointing the bevel parallel with the bed of the lathe so so straight down the bed of the lathe so i'm creating initially a straight spigot and then if i bring my tool around a little further i'm pointing the bevel inwards and then i can cut it do another cut and just create a little dovetail and when i get to the bottom of that i'm, I'm positioning the flute so so it's almost at um, nine o'clock so, so the left wing is, is, is against the wood, but the right wing is almost touching as well at that point. And that way, I'm sure that the tip of the gouge is going all the way to the bottom of that dovetail to create a sharp corner at the bottom. Um, so the, the chuck jaws aren't going to be sort of held out away from the ideal position by a, a rounded corner. So, so that's what I've tried to do there. So that's my my dovetail done. Um, so from there on, next thing is to, to shape the bowl. And with these um, colored bowls like this, what I'm trying to do is emphasize the outside of the bowl. So if I switch back to um, over here a minute, you see that one there, the, the outer shape of the bowl it's curving in at the top and that I think gives more emphasis to the outside of the bowl. If it was a conventional sort of flatter curve, your eye is more focusing on what's going on inside. Whereas here, because of that sort of turn in on the top third or so, you, 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 it makes the outside of the bowl more, more visible, even if you're looking at it from above. I mean, ideally you want to be sort of looking at that side on, but in reality, you're probably going to be looking at it like this. And even when it is like that, you, you're still seeing plenty of what's going on the outside. So that's my sort of reasoning behind the shape that I produce. So we switch back to the lathe again. So, so I've positioned my rest at 45 degrees now across the um, face of the blank there so, so I'm, I'm working across the corner here let me just reposition that camera just to whisk it there that's probably better so you can see the edge of the blank here um, so I'm just working on this corner so say with most things on wood turning you, you start off with a little curve on a corner and make it bigger so that's what we're going to do here and I'm, I'm going to continue with that pull cut initially quite a aggressive cut just to remove a decent amount of wood, wood as quickly as possible and then bring that rest in again close the gap down and do a couple more of those now because i'm turning the top in i'm cutting two-thirds of the way up and the other thing um relating to the shape of this blank just gonna tweak that camera so you can see the foot um, at the bottom of the foot, 
I'm going to have a transition between the painted surface and a plain wood foot because I'm going to cut the foot clean at the end of all this. Um, so to make that transition as narrow as possible, I want the angle of the edge of the foot to be as close to 90 degrees as possible. It's not going to be quite 90 degrees, but you can see here, let me just turn that off a sec, where I've turned it so far, I'll position the gauge there. Um, you see the angle of the gouge against the base of the bowl. That's the angle of the, the sort of the junction between the bottom edge of the bowl and the foot. So it's quite a shallow angle. So I'm going to get quite a wide transition. Um, and where the reason that matters is because on these bowls, I do a white base coat of gesso and then over the top of that, the color. So if I have a shallow angle on the edge here, you see a white ring when you cut through the gesso. But to avoid that, I put a little turned foot, sort of reverse curve, whatever you want to call it, right at the bottom of the bowl. And that way I get closer to that 90 degree transition. So carry on with this. Um, and by the way, that, that cut I just did, it's quite a rough cut and you can see here there's plenty of torn grain, but that's that's what I would expect to see at this stage. Um, but I'm just rough shaping, so it doesn't matter too much. So to get that reverse curve, I'm just going to go in and cut the other way now. A slightly lighter cut, so um, nowhere near as, as heavy a cut as I was just doing. So I'm just sort of generating that little reverse curve and then I can continue reshaping the rest of the bowl. So that's achieved what I want at the foot there. It's quite subtle, but um, even, even that small amount makes a difference, I think. So now I'm changing my cup slightly to, to refine the shape and to improve the the surface so so now i'm doing a less aggressive cut I'm, I'm dropping the handle down lower i'm still working on that left wing at this stage but with the handle drop lower, i'm taking more of a slice more of a shearing cut and a couple of cuts like that and hopefully you'll see a much cleaner surface it's not perfect but it's it's way better than those roughing cuts so so that's taken out Sort of 99 percent of that torn grain just just that those few lighter cuts um so so now i'm at the effectively up to the widest point here um so rather than continue the cut upwards from the bottom i'll swing my rest around the other way now just make sure that misses and it doesn't so adjust it just there so so um can't see my rest there can you Camera's moved. So there, there's where my rest is, parallel to the bed basically at this stage. So, so I'm working on this top section here. Um, and the reason I've moved the rest around here is I want to cut from the top down um, to do that top part of the curve. So I'll come in from the other side now, from the headstock side of the, the blank and start to shape this top part of the curve it's not quite round yet there was a cut blank I cut on my bandsaw so um, it wasn't exactly circular but that's easily fixed once it's on the lathe isn't it so that's roughly shaped it I'm just going to move that rest in just a little bit flat there I think so I'm just going to Again, change the cup, drop the handle, use the wing a little bit more to put a little bit more curve into that. That's better. And then I can come back from the other side as well. Blend that in from the other side where I've left a bit of a step. And as I'm doing this, I'm looking at the top edge of the bowl. I'm looking at the profile against the background to see where the shape needs a bit of a adjustment. 
smoothing out any bumps and ridges to get a, a nice curve. Um, so to me, that's looking not bad. I think two thirds of the way down here at about this position, there's a little bit of a, a bump there that I don't want. So I'll bring my gauge down to that position and continue with that shearing cut. Um, just work on that with, with light cuts just to further refine that shape. So that's got my overall shape. Now there's a, a secret weapon I have at this stage for checking the shape. Now visually, that curve looks about right to me. And um, I'm just going to zoom out. Yep, further, there you go. Um, visually, that curve looks about right to me. And if I run my finger around it, on the whole, it feels reasonably good. There's a little bit of a bump I can feel there. It's about three quarters of an inch in from where I did that foot. So it's, I probably didn't quite blend the curve from the foot into the bottom of the bowl. So just adjust that and then check it again. So that transition now feels, feels better. It's a better curve overall uh, and it looks about right. But what I do at this stage is to use one of these things. This is a hot melt glue stick. Um, it's, a, it's one of the thicker ones, I think they're 11 millimetres, um, which is, what's that, 7 sixteenths, isn't it? Um, and what you do is you use that as a flexible curve. So I pin the bottom of it to the bottom of the curve and the top of it to the top of the curve, like that. And then I get down and look between the glue stick and the edge of the bowl. If I can see light coming through, I know there's a, a deviation in the shape that shouldn't be there. It's, uh, it's, it'll show up any little changes in direction or changes in shape. So it's a very good way of checking whether you've got a good curve or not. And um, one of the cheapest tools in my toolbox, but one that gets used on almost every bowl that I make. So um, yeah, very useful tool. You can do the same with a, a thin strip of steel or something like that. Um, so whatever you can find, but yeah, glue sticks are great. Um, get yourself a sort of a 12 inch glue stick and uh, Paul, do up to can, Paul, can you do that on the back of the side of the bowl? So we're looking from your top camera down across that glue stick. Which camera? Sorry. The, so do it on the back side of your lathe on the back edge of the bowl because I think we'll get a better view of what you were looking at. Okay. With the glue stick. From, yeah, that, there, from go, that angle. Go, go back to the overhead. Overhead one, yeah. Okay, now put your glue stick on the back side of the lathe away from you so we can see. Okay. There you go. Over there like that. Yeah, so, so you can see there I'm pinning that to the to the bottom of the curve, all bar a little bit where that reverse curve is. It's, it's not quite flexible enough to do all of that, but from where the curve starts to where it finishes is where my two fingers are there. And what I'm doing is looking at the whole length of that curve and looking between the edge of the stick and the edge of the bowl. But where I would position that is higher up, so I'm looking at where the light is shining on the top of the bowl here. I mean, I've got an overhead light behind the lathe here, but um, and I, I could put that lower down, but where it is now with the cameras in place, it's, it, I'd have to sort of manipulate it around the camera boom to do it, so, so I, won't, I won't move it, but... Um, that's what I would do in practice. You, you put the light the other side of that stick. So you're looking at one side, the light's the other side. And when you pin that to the bowl there, if there are any little bumps and ridges, you see the light coming through. Um, so you can see where the little um, sort of imperfections in the curve are. And, and it'll, it'll pick up minute discrepancies. So, so it's really good for that. So a re really useful tool. Thanks, Paul. No problem. All right, I'm just readjusting my equipment here to get my sanding hood in place. So we can sand the outside of this. So, so the outside of that is as good as done. Um, I'm just going to take the tailstock away now. I've, I've not got a need for that at the moment. So I'll just take the whole thing away. Take it off the lathe. So 
So, sanding then. Um, so, on the outside of here, start off on maybe 150 grit um, and, and work down. But on this one, I'm not going to sand it ultra fine. Because I'm going to coat this with gesso, I want a good key for the gesso and um, not, not sort of sanding it ultra fine because that's going to reduce that. So I'm just going to sand it to 180. So I'll, so I'll start off on 150 and then sand to 180 and that's it. Um, so on the outside, that's all it, all it needs. So I'm just going to turn my dust extractor on there. Just getting the rest out of the way. So yeah, there's 180 grit. Uh, sorry, uh, 150. I'm just gonna zoom in a little more. So all I'm trying to do here is take out any tool marks, if there's any torn grain or anything like that, any bumps and ridges. And hopefully I've got pretty much all of the, the bumps and ridges with the the glue stick and the cuts with the uh, shear scraping cuts, the shearing cuts. And I'm sanding at the front or at the bottom, so, so sort of nine o'clock to six o'clock position, so where the bowl is going down and away, rather than sanding at the top where it's coming towards me. That's particularly important when you've got the piece of wood in a chuck. Because if you've got the wood coming towards you and your fingers slip off on the left, then um, you're going to hit the chuck with your fingers going the wrong, wrong way. So um, much better to sand near the bottom, sort of at the front or the bottom, so it's going down and away. If you slip there, then you, you, your fingers may contact the chuck, but it, at least your fingers are in the right direction. A little bit more up on this top edge, just to get a slightly better finish. Just because I'm going to coat this with gesso, doesn't mean I can cut corners on the sanding. If there's torn grain there, it will show through. Um, the gesso isn't going to hide that, even though it's a moderately thick um, sort of material that I'm going to put on, it, it doesn't get hidden by the, the gesso. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think you can use the, the application of the gesso to cut corners on this. I just muted myself for a second there, I was just about to sneeze, but <laughs> I think I've got past it. So I'm sanding all the way around to that little upturned foot and it is quite a small foot there. I could go a little bit bigger with that, to be honest, but uh, I think it's adequate. All right, let's have a look at that. Yeah, that looks reasonably good. That'll, that'll work. So, turn my extractor off now. Right, I'm just going to grab a paintbrush. Give me one moment. Right, so the next stage here is to put the gesso on. Um, most of the bowls, I, in fact, all the bowls I showed you earlier were done with this one, which is, let me go to the side camera, that'll give you a better view of it. That one there, it's, uh, it just says white gesso primer. This is acrylic, so, so great with all your acrylic paints, etc. Um, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I've also got this one here, which is a black gesso. Um, this one's a Joe Sonja's one, but yeah, there are no doubt other other brands out there so depending on what paints you want to use you can choose a base that, that works with it the great thing about the black is if you're using the iridescent paints and the reactant um, reactive paints then uh, interference paints they all work great on black but 
not so well on white. So, so if you if you're into that sort of thing, then go for black. So, take the lid off, and and this stuff. I'll switch to the overhead one again for a moment. This this here is you see it's white and it's sort of the consistency. I always say it's a consistency of yogurt. Um, so uh, and another thing I'm going to do here is just turn the speed of the lathe down. And one one last thing that I just remembered, fortunately, what I'm going to have to do is to remove this piece of wood off the screw chuck without um, disturbing the wet gesso finish. So what I'm going to do here is to loosen the screw chuck now so I can grip that finger and thumb like this and take it off without touching the wet surface. So I can put that to one side because this is going to take, I would say, a good hour to be touched dry, but I would leave it, well, I'd probably leave it overnight, to be honest, I'd leave it till the following day. Um, in some demos where I'm doing this live, what I do is apply heat um, in the form of a hot air blower, paint stripper type hot air, um, and, and you can dry it in a few minutes that way, but um, you've got to be careful not to overdo it, because if you overcook this, it starts to bubble. Um, creates an interesting texture, but if that's not what you want, then that's not what you want to do. Um, but yeah, generally, I'll take that off and put it down to dry and then come, come back to it another time. So I'll start painting this on and there's no finesse here. Just get it on thick and slowly rotate your piece of wood as you go. Yeah, this gesso that it, it keeps for years, um, so, so no problem about it going off in a short space of time. It does keep keep for a very long time. As long as you keep the lid on, it works well. So initially, the first time round, wood being what it is, it's like a sponge. It's sucking some of the moisture out of that gesso. So when I get back to the start, I might find that it started to thicken and dry ever so slightly because the woods just suck some of the moisture out of it. So what I'll do is do a first pass round to initially coat the wood, prime it if you like, and then I'll go round again and put a little bit more on and make sure that I've got a very fluid surface. So that's it. I think I've got all the way back round again. So I've got a nice coat in there. Now that's fairly random, I would say, is it's probably the best description of it. I'm just trying to adjust the camera there, getting a little bit closer. So you can see the brush marks here. Um, it's a very coarse brushed finish at this stage. Um, so, so that's what I'm aiming for. I'm just going to take off a little bit of the excess off the brush. So what I want to do now is to actually run the lathe. This is why I've, I, I just mentioned it's a good idea to turn the lathe down before you do this. If I turn that on at the speed I was turning the bowl, I'll end it with a, right, a white stripe down my smock. So um, remember to turn the speed of the lathe down um, before you turn it on with wet gesso on it. I'm just going to wind that in a little bit to try and get that to run a little bit truer. That's a bit better. It's not perfect, but it's close enough for it. So I'll bring the speed up a little bit maybe 100 RPM or something like that. And I'm just going to use this coarse brush on the outer edge of it. Let's bring the other camera into play as well. Hopefully you can see it on both angles there. So you can see I'm, I'm applying this brush to the edge and just dragging it across the surface. And what that's doing is, is just creating lines. This is a quite a coarse brush. You don't want a, a, an expensive soft brush here you want a, a very coarse bristle brush to give you quite a coarse texture when you do this so the the, the cheap brushes are i think the best for this, for this particular application so you can see there let's stop that um yeah you can see around the bottom here you can see the lines that that's created so that's the texture i used on the um the purple orange yellow bowl that's how i get that texture um you can texture this with any anything you you can think of. Um, another good one is things like tile spread, tile adhesive spreaders. Um, I've got an Afrocomb that I use on some of my bowls. 
um, I've got no other use for it, so so that's what I use it for. So so um, it it gives you a much coarser line than the brush. So so that was quite a nice one. Another one here, I've got this here, which is just ordinary paper kitchen towel, and this one came out by accident. You know, I, I just mentioned that I've got to slacken off the screw chuck so I can grip the blank like this and, and unscrew it while it's still wet. I was doing a demo at a trade show once and I forgot to loosen it. So I thought, how am I going to get that off without getting it all over my fingers? So my solution was this, put a bit of kitchen roll over it, put my hand over it to undo it and then took it away. And when I took it away, I thought, oh, that's quite an interesting texture. So that's where this one came from. So all I'm doing is putting the kitchen roll on and then taking it off again. So just creating a stipple sort of effect. And the, the more random, the better. So uh, you don't want to put any any pressure anywhere where you're going to sort of smudge it and smear it out. Just literally let the paper rest on the gesso and then peel it off. And that creates a nice stipple effect. Um, I'm just double checking that I've got it all the way around the inside of the bowl to, to where the foot finishes. That's, that's a bit that's easily missed if you're just going around the edge here. Um, so that's the whole thing, stipple textured now. And, and this, this bit of kitchen towel is, is now um, surplus to requirements. So we'll get rid of that. So that's the texturing part. So I'm just going to get rid of the excess just so off my brush and put the lid back on that and if you don't like that you can always go back over it with the brush reapply the gesso and take it off again um, i'm just going to put this brush in some water so it doesn't dry out back again so um <clears throat> yeah i, I I did a demo a while back and forgot to wash the brush out and it, the brush did go hard, but I discovered that um, ordinary paint stripper is good enough to loosen it. I just left the brush in a pot of paint stripper overnight and the following morning washed it out and it was good to go again. So that's the outside. I think the, uh, the if I shade it a bit, you might see more of that texture. But uh, yeah, that's we, we can got. see it. We can see it pretty good, Paul. Thanks. Great. OK. Right. So I'm going to put that to one side to dry. Like I said, that's going to take a few hours. Really, um, I'll, I'll leave it till the next day, at least. Um, so I've got a couple that I did yesterday, which are now dry and ready for us to take to the next stage. Um, I've got this one here which was one I turned from pine and I've done the, the brush texture on this one. So we'll do that one first. So I can screw that onto the screw chuck again. I don't want to screw it on tight because I might need to take that off while it's still wet. So just tight enough to hold it in place. Um, right, so what I need now is some paints. Um, I airbrushed the colors onto this because it's an effective way of applying the colors and it's a great way of blending them so airbrushes are the way to go for me i, I use airbrushes for most of my coloring um, even if it's effectively block coloring um, i'll still use an airbrush so the one i've got here is a, is, is a what they call a dual action airbrush what they mean by dual action is the trigger you've got two two directions of movement let me put it over here there that's better um, if I push that trigger down, that controls my airflow. And if I pull the trigger back, that controls my paint flow. So I can have all air, no paint, all paint, no air, or anywhere in between the two. So I've got full control over that. There's also a, a stop on the end here, which I can preset to limit how far back I can pull the trigger. So to, I limit the maximum amount of paint. Uh, and on this one, it's also got a little air adjustment here. So I can adjust the airflow on the gun as well. Um, I normally set the regulator to where I want it on the compressor. So that I don't really make a great deal of use of, to be honest. This is what they call gravity feed. It's got the, the cup above the 
um, the body of the airbrush and you put a few drops of paint in and it drops into the airflow. Um, I have some other brushes, airbrushes that I use, which are siphon feed that with those, you've got a bottle underneath and um, the bottle picks sort of picks up from the, the sort of siphon effect. Right. So colors, I'm just rooting through my box of um, airbrush paints here, grabbing a few out, see what we can do. I use the um, the airbrush colors. Um, I've got some by Golden, some Comart. There, there are a few other makes. I've got some paints which are Createx. Those are a little bit thicker, but yeah, still workable. And um, some of the paints are transparent, some are opaque. Um, you can use either on these because you're just using it on a white background, so you could get away with either. But uh, right, we'll do a purple and green. Uh, I think we'll do purple and green on the other bowl, and on this one, I'll do another one of those orange, yellow, purple. Oh, we've got the purple there, haven't we? Um, these, these bottles of paint, you can see there, they are smallish bottles. I think it does say on it how much is in there. One fluid ounce. Um, so, so that's how much is in one of those. But you're only using a few drops at a time. So one of these will actually go a good way. Uh, and each of these paints has an agitator in it. So you need to give them a good shake just to get the, the paint in, in suspension rather than all settled out at the bottom. So give them a good shake when you start. Another tip here, this bottle here, is, an, is, is, is one that I finished and I've just cleaned it out and filled it with water. Sometimes I just put a drop of water into the gun and blow it through just to blow a color through rather than doing a proper clean. Um, so it's just quick and easy. So um, it's helpful to have a, a source of water. So that's all that one is. Right, so I think all of those, I can hear the agitators moving in all of those. So we'll go with all of them. Um, so the purple, yellow, orange one here, I'd start off with a lighter color. So we'll start off with the yellow. And this one is, I'll show you the other bowl. So I'll show you what we're aiming for. We're going for this one. And it's yellow in the middle, two bands of orange, and then two bands of purple on the edge. So that's what I'm aiming for. I never, I don't thin the colors to change the tone. Um, if you want a lighter color, you just um, put less of it on. So if I want to shade with one of these colors, I just put less on. So, um, so I don't thin the colors to get it lighter, I just put less on. And, and again, that's a great thing about airbrushing. You've got total control over how much you put on. I've got my compressor already set up and I've, I've got these little bayonet connectors as well, which means you can just push the gun on and it's, it's, that's it, you, you're fixed on, and it's good to go, and then quick release. And uh, the other advantage of these is when you take the airbrush off, you don't lose the pressure out of the tank. It seals when, when you disconnect. So um, that's good to go. So paint's ready. This is, this is ready, ready to use. I don't need to thin it. It's thin enough already. It's almost like an ink. So maybe 10 or 12 drops of paint in there. You can see how much is actually in that cup. It's just a little bit at the bottom. That's enough for now. If I need more, I can add more. But um, that may be enough. So I'm going to start off spraying four or five inches away and aim in the middle. And you can see there's a yellow line developing there. And I'm bringing that out towards the edges and fading it out towards the edge. I'm just going to move my extractor hood there. So on sort of deepest color in the middle and then less on the outer edges. I've used probably half of that paint so far and you can see that's probably already done enough. I don't really need any more yellow on that. Um, the thing to remember with airbrushes is your spray pattern is generally a cone. So if you want to have a wider area, just move the airbrush farther away. And if you want a narrower line, bring it closer in. So all I'm aiming at here is the middle, so, and uh, that's probably enough. So I'm just going to get my 
little bit of paper towel there. And I'm just blowing the last couple of drops of paint out. Now, because I'm going darker and I'm blending these colours anyway, I'm not even going to bother to wash that gun out. I've just blown out the rest of the yellow paint and then I'll open up the orange and put some orange in there. And again, a few drops, half a dozen drops or so. And I can hey, Paul. Let me just, yes. We got a question in the chat. Somebody wants to know how far away from the wood are you holding your, your uh, paint gun? At that time on, on the spray I was doing there, probably four or five inches. But if you want a wider spray pattern, you can move the gun farther away because it's, it, you're spraying a conical pattern. Let me, let me demonstrate on this piece of tissue I've got in my hand here. I was just about to do this. If I want a very fine line, I'll put the gun very close. And then that's, that's coming out yellow at the moment. Let's wait till the yellow's, there you go. We've got orange now, it's a bit, bit easier to see. So if I hold the gun very close, then I can get something about the width of a pen, pen or pencil. See that there? Now, if I come a little bit farther away, I'm about an inch away now. You can see the width of the spray pattern there. And if I come farther away again, I'm at two inches now, bigger spray pattern, three inches away, bigger spray pattern. So you can actually adjust your distance for the area you want to cover. And you can go anywhere from a pencil line up to sort of the size of your palm. If it, by the time you're at sort of eight inches away, you're probably covering the size of your palm. Um, beyond that, I think you probably start to lose the inertia from the actual airflow. So probably don't wanna go much farther than that, but yeah, you, you can adjust. So, so here I'd say three, four inches, possibly five. And I'm starting off in the, actually, I don't want it in the middle, do I? I want it on the edge. Let's get it right. I'm putting that in the wrong place there. So I'm just doing a band what of orange. Speed? Say again? I'm sorry. What is the speed of your lathe right now? Uh, about 100 RPM. Okay. So it's going fairly slow. All I'm trying to do is bring the wood past the paint, um, but not fast. So it's going at a fairly slow speed. Yes, yeah, it's, it's on the on the dial. It's about 100 RPM. So yeah, about that. Um, as slow as your lathe will go. If it's if it won't go below 500, then you're going to have to work with what you've got. But um, this one does go pretty slow. So I've done my orange bands there, and the bit in the middle is predominantly yellow. I did I did do a little bit of orange. I didn't want it, but it's not not so much that it's going to be a problem anyway. So now I can go on to my purple, and again because I'm just um, going darker each time. I don't need to worry too much about cleaning the gun out because I'm blending these colors anyway. So now I'm aiming the purple on the rim. So you can see on that top edge, that purple band appearing. So I can, I can do it quite intense right on the edge and then move the gun a little bit farther away and blend that into the orange. A little bit farther away and then I um, put a little bit more of a sort of a mist on there rather than solid color so again at the bottom hard at the sort of close in right on the edge of the foot and then shallow as, on, as i'm coming away so so that's pretty much it i'm happy with that so i'll stop there so i'm just going to blow out what colors left in the gun and just just blow a little bit of water through i'll do the other one in a minute so i don't need to clean the gun out properly at this stage i'm just gonna put enough water through that just to blow through the bulk of that purple because the next color i'm going to use is a lighter color but that'll do <clears throat> so next thing to do with that is to see all the color um i'm just going to grab myself a tin of lacquer And with these particular colors, give that tin a quick shake. I don't really want a high shine on this. I think a, an almost matte finish works well. So I've got uh, a satin lacquer here. Um, you could go for matte if you want. I think satin's probably near enough. Um, so I'm just gonna give that a coat of satin lacquer just to seal the paint. 
And again, this is acrylic lacquer, so it's all compatible. I've got acrylic gesso, acrylic paints, and an acrylic lacquer over the top. So that'll be enough to seal that. So I'll give that 30 seconds to dry, and then I'll take it off, and then we'll move on to the other piece of wood. Any questions while that's just drying? I don't see no more in the chat. Yeah, I don't see any, Paul. Okay, that's great. All right, that's, that's sort of touch dry. It dries fairly quick, this stuff, or at least the initial touch dry stage is, is fairly quick. So I'll put that to one side. Is the, acrylic, is the acrylic paint dry before you? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, it dries very quickly. But if, if, if during spraying, if you're putting, let's say in one area, you're putting down quite a heavy coat of paint, if you want to dry that quick, you can just press the trigger on the gun to get air, but no paint, and you can blow that over the paint you've already applied to dry it faster. So, um, but yeah, light coats and it does dry extremely quickly. A um, few seconds and you're done. Uh, right, so, so this is the other one. This is the stipple texture. And I'm going to do a slightly different color on this one. I'm going to do a green and a purple. I quite like this one, so we'll do that one. Um, so, so I'll start off green at the bottom. Again, I'm four or five inches away. And you can see there, I've just done a very light mist of green. So fairly subtle. So if I want to leave it there, I can. If I want to put a little bit more, bit more color in, I can. Because I'm running the lathe fairly slow, I've got to try and remember not to move the gun sideways too quickly because I start to spray spiral patterns if I go too quick. So um, I'll get a bit carried away sometimes and move the gun too fast and then I have to remind myself to slow down. So yeah, just watch that. Um, you don't want to move too quick. Right, so so that's probably enough on the green. I could I could go heavier if I want, but I quite like this one to be quite a light coat. So a few drops of purple now, and we'll start at the edge. And you can see that purple hue appearing at the top of the bowl. Now I'll start to track that down, and as I'm going down, I can also move the gun farther away to to expand the area I'm covering also that has the effect of reducing the, the the sort of the paint density at any particular point so again you can use the the trigger to control paint and you can also use the distance depending on exactly what you're trying to achieve so a little bit more purple on there at the top I think that's not too bad. I'll put a little bit more purple at the top. What I do with some of my bowls, I'm not going to do it with either of these, but some of them, I'll do a very thin black line near the top, uh, top and bottom, and it frames the colours. Um, so depending on what you're doing, that that's um, also worth considering. Like I said, I'm not going to do it on this one, but uh, it is one that you can do. And then that's enough colour on there. So just blowing a bit of colour through the gun. Sorry, a bit of water through the gun to, to clean out the worst of that. And then I'll, cl I'll clean it properly in a moment. But while that's there, I'll, I'll put the, the lacquer on it. Actually, actually no, I'm not going to put the lacquer on This one, um, I showed you a bowl earlier, this one here, that I said I'd, I'd sort of sanded back the high points of the texture. So I'll, I'll do that on this one. So what I'm going to do is pick up a fine grit, 400 or 600. I've got 600 grit here. Um, and I'm going to speed the lathe up a little bit. And all I want to do is take off enough material to expose the high points of the texture. So I'm not sanding all the colour away, all the, all the texture away just really exposing the high, high points. So you can see here now, totally different effect. So it's exposed all that stipple pattern and just giving it a totally different feel. So um, I quite like that effect. So, so I do it on some of the bowls. Some, some I just do solid color, but um, I quite like that. Um, and what I've also done once I've got it to that stage is put a third color over it 
a lighter color and the lighter color only really shows up on the white that you've exposed so i could put let, let's say a, a yellow or a light blue or something like that on there um, and that would only pick up on the um on the white parts and the green and the purple parts it wouldn't really show up so um that's an interesting effect as well where you're adding colors and uh overlaying them in that way so i'll bring the speed down again so a little bit of clear lacquer it's best to do that sanding before the lacquer otherwise you've just got more sanding to do so three or four light coats that should do it and then while that's drying i'm just going to clean this gun out and what i'm going to do here i've got some airbrush cleaner here in this bottle this one's a uh, an off-the-shelf airbrush cleaner but if you haven't got that probably a few drops of sort of dishwashing detergent or something along those lines and then i've got a little brush here that i can just put into the cup and give that a sort of wash around with a brush if you've got over over spill on the outside of the cup you can wash that off with a brush as well and i'm just working that into the bottom of the cup to loosen any paint deposits that are in there at this stage and also while you've got that cleaner on the end of the brush it's a good idea to apply that to the end of the nozzle as well so i'm just putting the brush into the end of the nozzle there again you, you can get build up a paint there so clean that as well at this stage and then i can blow all of that out and I'll just oh we had a, a question of... what kind of paint were you using what brand the, um those were all golden golden airbrush paints and, and they were all opaque um golden do opaque and transparent so you can use either but um i was using the opaque ones there for, for some effects the transparent works quite well you you then combine colors rather than mask them out when you put one color over another um but in this instance um i'm using opaque paints and i'm limiting the the sort of the blending of the colors by just the, the amount of paint i'm putting on so um, you can do it either way right so i've cleaned my gun out so i can put that away just done that while we're waiting for that lacquer to dry <clears throat> Yeah, this is one of the pots that I've always using. See that one there? Golden airbrush colour. Um, like I said, they're, they're a one ounce pot. So smallish, but for this application, that will actually go a long way. Because I've probably used six to ten drops of each of these colours. And there's the same one, purple. As I said, these are all opaque, but um, you can get them in. Um, opaque or trans transparent translucent um they also do other things like the um interference paints and pearlescent paints and all that sort of thing i've got some other paints the comart ones i've got are are all um pearlescent ones they're quite interesting and i'll use those on these bowls sometimes so i do them they're quite loud colors sort of in your face colors um so i use those sometimes but the um the, the the createx paints are they are thicker so i use a gun with a bigger nozzle because the paints are thicker it's, it's not just a case of um a thicker paint you can water it down that doesn't always apply the particle size of the paint doesn't change when you water it down so if the particle size is too big to go through your gun then they still won't go through the gun even if you thin them down so um, then, then you've got to basically have a gun with a bigger nozzle. Um, the one I was just using with those golden paints was a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. That's absolutely fine with those. With the um, the Createx paints, I'll use either a 0.5 or 0.8. So it's a bigger nozzle. Um, if you use that with the thinner paints, they flow an awful lot quicker. 
quicker so <laughs> things run out quicker so um yeah you, you can do it but uh and if you want to cover a big area that also allows you to color faster i suppose so i'm just putting my chuck on there lathe here so we can put these bowls on and turn the inside so let me put that in the chuck and, I, and once it's in the chuck i'm just pressing the center of the blank against the chuck and then tightening up so that's seating the bottom of that bowl against the jaws so it's seated it squarely i'll just move my just put out the way all right so i'm setting the the rest up across the, the face of the bowl and then set the height so my gauge is cut in pretty much on center that might be just a whisker too high so bring that down again uh, oh there it is just looking for my visor so i'm still running that fairly slow so i'll bring that speed back up to turning speed which for a bowl this size is sort of eight to nine hundred rpm and then I can start on the edge, push cut towards the centre. All I'm trying to do at this stage is to flatten off the top surface. And also, what I'm doing here is cutting through the paint that's oversprayed the edge of the bowl. So um, I didn't need to do any masking because at this stage, I'll cut that edge clean. So hopefully there I've cut enough away to get a clean edge on the paint, which it has. So um, yeah, it just saves all that um, messing around with the masking. So that works quite well. I'm just going to demist my visor. So let's see what I'm doing. Okay, so, so now I've just taken off enough to flatten the surface there. Let's do it this way around instead. So I'll start near the centre. I've got my handle low and the point of the gauge starting about three quarters of an inch away. And then as I, as I lift the handle, I pull it back towards me. So, so where the gauge finishes is almost horizontal when I hit the centre of the bowl. And with each cut, I'll just go in a little wider a little deeper so start off with the handle low and then pull it back towards me and up now where i want to be standing is right up against the bed of the lathe so so i'm as close to the gouge as i can get and by keeping that the distance between me and the handle of the tool as, as small as possible um maximizing control from my own sort of perspective let me just uh move my other camera over here i can show you probably better on this one that's a bit better so you can't see the bowl but you can see me um so so where i'm starting is with the handle down here almost touching the bed of the lathe and then as I, as I, and as you can see, I'm almost leaning against the bed. This is a short bed lay, so it's sort of not, not a long bed anyway. Um, start off low there. And as that handle comes back towards me, I'll move with it and keep lifting the handle. Where I finish is about there with the gouge handle at that point, virtually horizontal. Um, so what I'm aiming for is to start low and bring the handle up and finish at, set, at center. And, and where I want the handle to finish, the reason it's where it is is because at that point the tip of the tool is touching the center of the bowl so that's what i'm aiming for is to eat for each cut to finish on the center of the bowl so back to the bowl tool in there push it inwards handles reach my side so i move with it so as with most cuts, it pays to get your feet in the right place. So I've got my feet positioned about shoulder width apart so that the start of the cut I'm leaning against the lathe, but at the finish of the cut, I'm away from the lathe 
and the tool is positioned so it's cutting at 90 degrees to the bed so i so i cut to the center of the um yeah, put another light on there cut to the center of the bowl Flute it at about 45 degrees keep going with that cut I can probably go a little bit faster here, Just give it another 100 RPM or so. Now these bowls, um, because of that shape of the rim, uh, the, out, the, the top of the outside of the bowl I mean, um, if I'm going to make the wall thickness of this bowl fairly uniform, what I need to do is to follow the shape of the inside of the, um, to match the outside. So, so I've got to undercut the rim slightly to achieve that because the, the outer surface of the bowl turns in at the top. So to, to achieve that sort of even wall thickness, I've got to match the shape inside and out. I'll stand back a bit so I don't get in the way of the camera. So depth wise, I, I think I'm about two thirds of the way in there. What I can do is, I and mean, this is just using my chuck key, push the handle of the chuck key in, eyeball across the edge of the bowl, so I know where the end of it is. So yeah, it's just over halfway. So a little, little more to go depth-wise. So thickness of these bowls, I'm, I'm probably at about half an inch there. I don't make them ultra thin, but I will go a little bit thinner than that. Um, but what I'll also do at this point is shape the rim. So what I'm going to do is angle the rim in. And what I'm trying to do here is to get more or less a 90 degree tan transition from the outside of the bowl to the rim on that, on that corner. So that's what I'm trying to do when I'm angling that rim in there. And of course, by angling the rim like that, it makes it look wider. So that means I've got to take even more off. So we're doing the cut here. Now at this stage, I'm just going to rearrange things a little. Doing that undercut means let me go to the overhead camera here. To achieve that undercut, it's all about where you point the bevel. So at the start of the cut initially, my handle was about here. You can see the angle of the tool against the rest there. But as I come nearer the edge, the handle's moving farther away to get that bevel angle farther to the left. So well, I've got to bring my handle all the way over here to get that undercut. And you can see the angle there against the rest is quite a shallow angle. So what I'm going to do for that top section is to move the rest. And I'm going to turn it this way at 40, well, sort of 45 degrees ish, maybe a little bit less and, and put that into the bowl. So I'm now, when I've got my gauge over here, you can see the angle of the rest against the tool. It's more like 90 degrees. So it's more stable less chance of the gouge sort of skating sideways across the rim. So, so it makes it, um, it's, it's supported better and it's more stable. Now, I'm going to try and do this without getting in front of the um, side camera, but uh, can't guarantee it. <laughs> I'll do my best. So I'm doing this sort of at arm's length rather than getting close in, because if I get any closer, you'll see, you'll see I'll get in front of the camera there. So, so I'm holding the, 
to go as far out as I can. So I've got the tip of the gauge in there. Now because of that rest position, that's as far as I can go. I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the end of the rest there. So I can't go all the way around the curve. I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, the rest isn't in the right place to do that. But I can come back round here and achieve that undercut. And then let me just stop the lead there. Just get a, I'm just using my fingers to, to gauge the thickness of the wall there. Um, and I can feel that thickening up as it's going down. So still plenty of wood to take out. Paul, um, Paul, Paul. Yes. Um, you're blocking the camera with your body in your hand. Is it possible to raise the camera a little bit so we get a better look at the cut? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep out of the way of this. I can't move the camera, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, all right. Done a desk, so thanks. Just, uh, keeping myself down as much as possible. Um, I might be able to extend the boom on the other one slightly, the overhead one. Get that one slightly farther in at the top. Still not ideal. Yeah, that's about as good as I can get with the overhead one, I think. Right, let's see where we are. Yeah, that's still a bit thick at the bottom of that. Um, the top of the rim is now, let's say, three-eighths of an inch, so I'm about as thin as I want to go on the rim. Take one more cut at the top. That's better. So now I've got the the wall thickness at the top I'll go back in and cut from just inside the rim take another cut there that's a little better so I'll bring my rest around a little bit more now so I think the top section's good I'm just going to take a bit of this wood out from the inside now <laughs> so I'll take some of that surplus wood away there and then uh, Come back to where I was part way down the curve. And then just check where I am on the inside there. I can go a little bit thinner. So we'll take a bit more out here. Okay, so back to the rim, well, so not the rim, but back to the wall of the bowl, let's say, and then pick up the cut there. And that would have thinned it down a bit. That's more like it. So it's just the center section. Do this curve here around the side of the bowl isn't too bad. I think finish wise, that's okay. I can, I can do one more cut from more or less from the edge down just to clean that up. And if I hold the flute slightly more vertical, the cut is more on the wing than it is on the tip. 
so that's given me more of that slicing shearing type cut and you can see the difference in the shavings there much finer shavings which is usually an indication of a better surface so that's just a sort of a clean up cut on the section that I've already done and now I'm going to put the rest a little bit lower because I'm overhanging the rest more now when I hit the bottom of the bowl so to get the get the the rest in the right sort of position I'm actually positioning it somewhat lower let's just uh, drop that camera there you can see where the center of the bowl is and where the rest is but when I've got the tool on the rest when I hit the center of the bowl it is angling downwards but not by a great deal so as that distance between the bottom of the bowl and the rest increases as you go deeper I think it works to to drop the rest as you go that's the way I do it so back to my sort of flute at about 45 degree position cut this surplus wood away Now when I'm hitting the centre of the bowl, what I'm trying to do is position the gouge so the bevel's pointing straight across so I leave the bottom of the bowl flat and also with each cut I'm concentrating on positioning the gouge so I cut all the way to the centre. If I don't cut all the way to the centre, I'm going to leave a pimple in the middle of the bowl. And also, you can see here, I'm slowing the tool down. As I approach the centre, the peripheral speed of the point where I'm cutting reduces because the diameter where I'm cutting is effectively reducing as I approach the centre of the bowl. So as the diameter reduces, the speed of the wood past the tool reduces. So I need to allow the tool more time to cut, so I slow it down as I approach the centre. So um, I'm just running my fingers around that curve to see how it feels and also checking the thickness so that's good on the thickness and shape wise we're pretty close there I think so maybe one more clean up cut so a very light cut again all the way to the middle and if I get that right then I leave the bottom of the bowl flat there's no divot or dimple um, and shape wise run your finger around the bowl backwards and forwards a few times and if there's any deviations in shape you can feel them um, so that's a, a good a test as you can get really so that's it on the inside Paul that's can you show us the, the that tool you're using the grinder there's a few questions about the grind and the type of tool you just used yes I'll switch to different camera for that Right, bring that back. So that there is the tip of my bowl guys that I was just using. Albeit upside down, but uh, you see the edge there. It's 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 a straight grind rather than a um, fingernail grind. And you can see also there are two bevels. And the reason for that is I want the working bevel to be a little shorter. And by shortening the working bevel, let me... Um, just reposition this camera. Is that going to work if I put it that way? More or less. No, it's upside down. Isn't it? Um, right, that'll do. Upside down, but yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> you can see there the bevel and the two the, the, the two bevels. Um, the second bevel is just taking that corner off to shorten the working bevel to a half or less um, of the the thickness it was so I mean this is a half inch gauge so that that top bevel is less than quarter of an inch I'd say um, maybe um, three sixteenths something like that so so that's what I do and, and and the shorter bevel helps the tool follow an internal curve better thank you Paul so that's okay no problems 
I'm just going to lift up this camera back here. So we'll switch back to this view. If I zoom out a little on that one, we're almost doubling up. That'll work. All right, so dust hood back and just going to sound the inside of this now. Now, hopefully, um, I can start off at 120, 150. I'll start off on 120. I don't think the inside was quite as good as the outside, so start off on 120, see where we go. Lost my... That was it. And when you're sanding, it pays to drop the speed down a little. So I've knocked a, a couple of hundred RPM off the speed there because sanding just creates it. <coughs> just, <coughs> excuse me, sanding just creates heat. So um, slowing it down a bit, reduce the heat. I think if you overheat the abrasive, it doesn't, doesn't last as long. It glazes and stops cutting as well. So overcooking your abrasive doesn't help and some woods are quite sensitive to heat you get heat checking on the surface and it's you get these little cracks and crazing appearing on the surface I mean they, they, they do refer to that as heat checks in some of the literature you read so um, it pays to keep the heat down so you don't actually cause problems with the wood some woods are more sensitive to others, and generally speaking, the more expensive the wood, the more sensitive it is to heat. So just bear that in mind when you buy yourself a nice bit of expensive rosewood or something. Don't overcook it when you're sanding. And once I've sanded, I've got a, a nice big sash brush here, and I just brush the dust out. Normally when I'm working, I've got a respirator on. Or, or a visor. I mean, I've got a visor here, but um, it's not easy to talk through the respirator, so uh, I, I don't wear that when I'm doing demos anyway. But again, run, run my fingers round it, and if I think there's a little bump in the middle, what I can do is hand sand that, just sanding with the grain across the centre. So if, I, if either I didn't spot a bump in the first place, or if one's appeared because I was sanding around the centre but not over it, quite as well which can happen because remember what I said about the centers moving slowest which means that sounds less so although it was flat to start with it might not stay that way if you over sand it so yeah sanding the, the center by hand sometimes is the fastest way to flatten it and where I'm sanding here is just under the rim that's the one point that's going to need the most attention the, the section under the rim here, where my finger is here, is more or less end grain, at least on two sides of the bowl. So that's where, if you're going to get any damage, that's where it's going to be most obvious. So um, if you've got any bruising or torn grain or anything like that, that's where it's going to be. So that's where you need to put a little bit more effort into the sanding to, to make sure you sanded through all of that. That's looking reasonable. So we can drop down to 180 grit. And I'm sanding the rim and all of the inside. So I'll do the edge first. And then work my way into the center. Get rid of that dust. So again, use the brush to blow that dust out, rather than blowing it. The way I look at it is if you're close enough to blow the dust out, you're close enough to blow half of it back in your face, which is never a good idea. So uh, using the brush means that I don't need to get any closer than 
is absolutely necessary when I'm sanded. <coughs> it doesn't do you any good. Right, so that's looking better. I think I'll just hit that for one more show just in the middle there. That's it. And I'll drop down to the next grip, which is 240. Sand the rim. Sand the inside. Now on the inside, I'm just going to do a, a sand and see the wax finish. So I do need to sand it to a finer finish than I did on the outside because I'm not hiding the surface. Um, it's going to be a polished wood, wood inside. So sand that to whatever grade you think is is right. I think with this bowl, I'll probably go to 320, maybe 400. Um, 320 is probably about right. I remember once reading up on, on the grits and um, I, I did a review for a magazine actually on one particular brand of abrasive and there were the some american made abrasive and, and i discovered that the grades that they use in europe all start with a p and they're actually slightly coarser than the american equivalent so what you call 180 grit we call p180 and the p180 is actually slightly rougher than the the 180 that is sold of your side of the pond so the, the grits are not absolutely the same. There's, there, there's not a massive difference, but there is a difference. So if I stopped at 400, you could probably stop at 320 and you'd be at about the same place. It's sort of one, one grit adrift, if you see what I mean. So- um, Paul, Paul you, one of your cameras is blocking most of the screen. Oh yeah, I didn't notice that. Thanks Ruby. It's dropped down because I extended the boom. <laughs> Too much leverage on it. Let's put that one back at the top. All right, leave that one up there. I'm too busy talking and sounding to notice what was happening with the camera. That bowl gouge that you used on the inside, is that a half inch American or a half inch your version? Sorry, I missed that. Can you say it again? The the bowl gouge that you were using, is that a half inch is an American version or a five eighths version? American. That is a half inch by British measurement, which means it's five eighths American version. Thank you. That was a question in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, the American version is 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 measured on the bar size. Uh, the British way of measuring a bowl gouge is from one side of the flute to the opposite side of the bar. So, so that half inch measurement is from the flute to the edge of the opposite edge of the bar. Um, so, so the half inch that I measure would be a five eighths bar. Thanks. Well, I'm on the last one here. I'll do it, I'll do it to three twenty. And then just blow the dust out of there, see how it looks. Not bad. Right, so I can put sanding sealer on that. And because on all the rest of it I've used acrylic, I'm going to use an acrylic sanding sealer. So I've got a, an aerosol acrylic sanding sealer here.
again two or three light coats give it 30 seconds between coats to dry I'm, I'm cheating slightly and going slightly quicker than that but uh, that'll do and then give that a minute to harden doesn't take long No, a little bit longer if you're really impatient you get a bit of paper kitchen towel and and burnish it dry with that the heat and the friction will will just dry it that little bit quicker but uh just be patient and let it let it dry naturally that's dry there that's good to go so i've got some four zeros wire wall here and I'm just going to cut the sand and sealer back with that. When you put any liquid finish onto wood, it soaks into the pores in the wood and air comes out. And when that air's coming out in a fast drying finish like this, you get like micro air bubbles drying in the surface of the finish. So it feels slightly rough. So cutting the surface back like this cuts through all those bubbles and takes them away and flattens off the remaining surface there you get a smoother smoother surface so that's that done it's always worth at the final stage just a few wipes along the grain turn the bowl around and do the same the other side and what you, you're doing here is if there are any sort of lines from where you have this on the lathe running the power you just cut those lines away so there's no none of those concentric rings that you sometimes see in your finish so that's a, a good way of getting rid of those and then i'm just going to brush any remaining residue away and then i can apply some wax i've got renaissance wax here which is a microcrystalline wax i prefer that for most of what i do actually i prefer it to the Paul, what is your wood on this piece? This is sycamore. Okay, thanks. But it's, it's the English version of sycamore, which as you can see is much plainer. It's got, it's got a nice little bit of figure in it and a little bit of a chatoyance as they call it, um, but um, not, not the, the markings you, you see in the American type of sycamore. We, we, we have London Plain, which I think is a closer match to the American sycamore. Right, so that's applied a bit of wax and then just got to buff that. And I've got safety cloth, they call it safety cloth, it's just paper, so it'll, this stuff just tears if it gets caught, so uh, hence the name safety cloth. You could use kitchen towel, but I think this is actually just a little bit softer and a little bit thicker, so it's probably a little bit more absorbent. But I tend to use this stuff over and over again, and then every now and again, I'll sort of flip it onto a clean fold and then do it again. And eventually my bit of paper towel ends up totally impregnated with the wax and then I'll throw it away and start again. So that's buff that. Finish, nice shine. So, take that out of the chuck and check. Always worth having a look at this stage. So I can move that around and see that the inside of the bowl, I've not got any damage there that I should have got, got, got rid of. That looks okay. Um, so what I need to do now is sort out the bottom, get rid of that spigot and finish the foot. So my way of working there is to bring the tail stop back in. And just put my live centre back as well. So what I try and do to finish the bottom of the bowl is to hold it on a mandrel. And by that, I mean 
something that looks like this. Let me just switch to the overhead one. I'll probably give you a better view there. So piece of wood there, and it's it's domed a little, so it's shaped a little to fit the surface of the bowl there. So that that one's not bad size-wise and shape-wise. So I'll use this one. I've got a few of these with different curves, um, and all that it was it, this started life as it was the bottom of something else. I parted off, so I I, I left the obviously it's got the chuck spigot on it already so that means i can put that into the chuck and use that to drive my bowl and then to, to because i've just polished the inside of this bowl and don't want to damage it i need to protect it so i've got a piece of non-slip router mat here which is as you can see just a rubber mesh and, and a, a piece a piece of kitchen towel here so i'll put the kitchen towel against the router mat the kitchen towel goes against the inside of the bowl like that and then i'll hold the whole lot up to the mandrel there bring my tailstock in and that center mark that i made earlier this is where it comes into play i can use that for relocating the center of my bowl so so my bowl's going to run through and that's running pretty good so i can bring my tool rest in now and have that just below the tail center there so i'm not touching the tail center or damaging it but i've got the rest close enough in and, and i'm going to switch to a 3 8 spindle gauge here again thinking they'll grind on the spindle gauge there and i can remove that spigot so again initially just cut away the bolt with that sort of pull cut to the left, cutting towards the headstock. And when I get close to the center, I can roll my gouge over slightly and use the point of the tool. And the bevel runs against the tail, um, the live center. So, so because the bevel's running against the center there, it's not going to cause any damage to either the center or the tool. So um, it's, it's quite safe to do, and it I'm using a ring centre here, so I'm leaving about a half inch stub in the centre, which I can't take off here, but I'll deal with that in a minute. And I'll just zoom in just a little more, just to just that camera position there. So I can cut from the edge to centre now. So I haven't taken the bulk of that spigot away. I'm just forming the foot now. So see, as I'm doing that, I'm gradually removing the paint and getting that clean cut on the bottom of the color as well. So this is where I'm getting that 90 degree cut that I was talking about earlier. And I'm also trying to slightly undercut the bottom of the bowl, make the bottom of the bowl slightly concave. So, so I leave a, a bowl that's going to stand on, the, on a flat surface without rocking. And I'm just going to do one more cut with the tool rolled over pretty much on its side. Again, trying to get a slicing, shearing cut to get a clean cut as possible across the bottom of the bowl that's about it and then I can move my tool rest away bring the dust hood back in and then sand the bottom I obviously can't sand all of the bottom, but I can do the outer two thirds of it. Just have a look at that. Doesn't look too bad. A little bit more maybe. Yep, that'll work. And then 
I'll sign 180 as well. Now that stub in the middle, I obviously can't deal with that on the lathe. So what I'm going to do now is take it off that mandrel, retrieve my pad, which has saved the inside of the bowl without damage, and my next way of attacking the bottom bit I've got here. Again, this, this was another piece of wood that was the bottom of something else I parted off. I've drilled a hole through it and put a Velcro sanding arbor in there. So I'll put that in the chuck, got my Velcro arbor mounted now. And then if I put a piece of 80 grit on the arbor there and turn the speed of the lathe up as well. So I'm just going to sand the base here. So I'll just angle that back slightly so I can see what I'm doing. Sand at the bottom of the pad. Because obviously if I'm sanding at the edge of that pad, it's moving fastest at the edge. So it sounds quicker if I sand at the edge. Don't need to use a lot of force here. That'll cut through it pretty quick at 80 grit. I use this quite a lot on my bowls. I do have a vacuum truck, so when I need to, I can use a vacuum truck. But for the odd one, I'll do it this way because it's quicker. So that's got away, got rid of the bulk of that stub at the uh, 80 grit stage. So now I'll just drop down to 120 and refine it. And every now and again, I'll just turn the bowl through 90 degrees or so. So I even out the, the sanding across the bottom of the bowl so I don't leave any high spots or any areas that are more heavily sanded to leave grooves and ruts in it. So I'm just trying to even out the sanding across the bottom. And now I'll do the same again with a 180 grit pad. Same with any sanding process, go down through the grits, blend it in with each successive grit. So with each pad I'm using, I'm actually going slightly wider across the foot to make sure I don't miss any areas that the last one was sanded up. So that's it at 180. So from there on, let's go back to this camera here. The last bit across the bottom here, I'll do by hand. I've got a piece of, what should be, yep, 240 grit. So I'll just hold that against the side of my small. I don't hold it in front of me because of the zip. So I'm just holding it to one side. Sand that by hand at 240 grit. And I'm sanding with the grain, so it makes it less, less obvious that it's, if there's any sanding marks, you, you won't notice them if they're, if they're with the grain. So push that away, and then a little bit of wax on the bottom there. There's enough wax left on my pad from when I wax the inside of the bowl there. Put some wax on there. And my extractor off and then buff the bottom part of the bowl. And that's the bottom done. Um, apart from putting my name on it, obviously. So there you go. Finished bowl. Well, I'm not on the subject of doing the names on the bottom. Um, let me show you. 
what I'm doing on the, one of my more recent ones. I've, I've, I've started doing this now. I'm doing that with a laser engraver. So uh, doing that rather than me trying to sign it by hand, it's a bit neater. My handwriting is not the best. <laughs> so I do it, by, do it that way. So, so that's the bottom finish. You can see the, the sort of the, the picked up the texture with the, the little bit of sanding I did just to take some of the color off the peaks. So that sort of picked up the height of the texture across the whole surface on the outside and sanded and polished on the inside. Excellent demonstration, Paul. Very, Very nice. Much. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? What kind of laser? That's a, a one way 2436. Sorry, 2416. No, a laser. Um, the laser. Oh, the laser. Oh, it's, um, I thought you said lathe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a GCC laser spirit, I think. Um, it's, it's got quite a big bed. It's a big machine. Um, the whole thing's about nearly five foot long. Um, okay. But it'll do just over two foot long and 18 inches height, um, 18 inches wide. Um, I wanted one with a big bed. My, my plan is to do things like platters and engrave on the rims and things like that. So I wanted a big machine that would cover a, a, a bigger bed area. Mm. The, the small portable machines are great for what they do, but um, I just wanted to do bigger things with, with, with it. So I've, the one I've got is a 40 watt CO2 laser. So, so that'll, that'll burn and cut most things. Oh my God, yeah. But I've started making, I think I showed them in one of the previous meetings, I just grabbed one. Um, I, I, I've, like I said, I bought it predominantly for engraving on wood and perhaps doing platters and things like that. But um, I started making things like this, it's an angle jig. So you can put this on your tilt table on the grinder and the angle on the end there um, gives you the bevel angle to set the table. So, um, and each of these corners has got two, two angles on. Um, and on, the, on there I've written all the common um, angles I use for my bevels on gouges and scrapers and all sorts of things. So uh, it's just a sort of a multi-purpose grinder. So I've got eight different angles on there and that covers almost all the angles I use. So, um, just something else, but uh, yeah, I was I, I did those sort of just after Christmas. I think I was um, playing around with it, and uh, I bought some of this plastic sheet. This is sort of eighth of an inch thick, I think roughly, um, and it's great for stuff like this. And and yeah, it'll cut cut that easily. I think it will cut probably eight mil, eight to ten mil, um, something like that. Oh, nice demo, Paul. Yeah, very, very good. Okay. Fantastic. Good demo. Thanks, Paul. Well, absolutely, absolutely. For sure. But lots of tips, uh, any, information here. If anyone thinks of any questions down the line, you know where I am. Just, just drop me a line, um, either Facebook or email, whichever. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if you think of any afterwards that you didn't think of today. So just, just drop me a line. Yeah, this other one um, that I coloured earlier, that's pretty dry now. I could actually put that back on the lathe and turn it. That's dry enough to finish. Um, so I could could do that. The, the, the paint on that's that's good. The, the, the gesso one that I prepared earlier, I would leave that, um, if, unless I try and accelerate it, I'd leave that until tomorrow at least um, before, before trying to um, put that back on the lathe and colour it. But... Uh, like I said, if you're if you're really in a hurry, get a hot air blower and um, you can dry it pretty quick. <laughs>